السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد You know uh, I, I want to start by saying that I am uh, inshallah genuinely and sincerely very very happy and very excited to be here and uh, sometimes this is just a generic way of starting the the talk and starting the, the event and, you know I'm so happy to be with you <laughs> and he's not really happy to be I just want to go home you know <laughs> but I'll tell you why I'm, I'm really really happy to be here um, one time a guy took Shahada and uh, at some event and when we were done someone came up to me and he said you know when someone takes Shahada I just want to cry how do you keep yourself from not crying I said like this That's how. It's not hard for me. If someone takes shahada, it doesn't move me. Yeah? So, some people are moved by that. I'm not moved by that. What I'm moved by, when people come, and they gather, and they make their way somewhere, because they want to learn something about the religion of Allah. So that's the first reason why I'm genuinely happy to see all of you. That's why I'm very happy to be here, because I know so many of you you want to give da'wah, you want to you know, learn the techniques of giving da'wah. So that's the first reason I'm very happy and very excited to be here. Um, uh, just a little bit about myself, just so we can get to know each other better. My name is Kamal al makki Originally, I'm from Sudan. Uh, right now I'm from Virginia, but originally I'm from Sudan. And I just actually arrived from Sudan yesterday. I'm going back when the course is over, inshallah. And, uh, you know, Sudanese people, they're... Uh, they're yeah, I mean, they're the greatest people on earth if, if you're not familiar with them and uh, we're so good we're such great people that the Saudis any Saudis in the audience Allah I'll pretend you didn't put your hand up <laughs> Saudis are jealous of us <laughs> yes they're so jealous of us that they made up a lot of jokes about how lazy Sudanese people are <laughs> yeah but we're not so they make up all kinds of jokes. And actually, I don't even want to mention these jokes. Like the one about the four lazy Sudanese guys, they robbed the bank. So they came back with the money, and they're too lazy to count it. So every five minutes, one of them is like, shall we count the money? Ah, later. Another five minutes, come on, let's count the money. Ah, later. Come on, let's count the money. One of them says, why should we count the money, huh? We'll listen to the news, we're going to find out how much we got away with. <laughs> See what I'm talking about? They try to say that we're lazy. They tell you that this lazy, lazy Sudanese guy walks into a barber shop. He sits down like this. Barber says, what, what should I do for you? He says, shave my beard. He says, okay, lift your head up. He says, you know what, just cut my hair. <laughs> they tell you a uh, Sudanese guy was lying out in his bed in the, in the yard. So his wife knocks on the door. He doesn't want to get up because he's lazy. So he calls for his son. Son, open the door for your mother. So he says, uh, Dad, I have exams. I'm studying here. So he tells his daughter, Yabit, open the door for your mother. She says, I'm cooking. I've got stuff to do here. So he found no one else in the house except him. He has to get up, open the door. So he yells out to his wife, I divorce you. Go back to your father's house. <laughs> now, <laughs> one time I'm on the plane on the way to Australia. And the guy next to me is a Saudi. He introduces himself. The minute he hears Sudan, he starts immediately cracking jokes about how lazy Sudanese are. And I'm like, I don't even know you. <laughs> but he tells me this joke, but they actually now updated this joke. There's a new version of this joke. The new version is, after he tells her that, she says, okay, okay. I'll open up my purse and take the keys out. <laughs> so she had the house keys and she's that lazy. She won't open But... Of course we're not lazy like that, yeah? Alright, so uh, you know what? You know how you, who has taken raise of faith before? Sheikh Walid, right? Fantastic, excellent. You know how Sheikh Walid, he has uh, uh, break managers? Yes. I have joke managers, yeah? So we're going to need two brothers and two sisters who will be with us, inshallah. And whenever you feel that we need a, a break, you stand up or you put your hand up and I crack a superb joke, inshallah. How about that? 
How about we pick the joke managers right now? Two brothers? Excellent. One, another brother? Another joke manager? There we go. Two sisters? Joke managers? Okay, very good. One there and another one over there. Excellent. And you know what sisters, I'll tell you in advance, you're not going to like me very much. Because I joke a lot. And I joke about multiple marriage a lot. And I heard that's a sensitive issue here. But I have a solution for you, so it's not a sensitive issue anymore. We're going to talk about that later. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about this course and how we came up with this idea. And who read the introduction? Fantastic. Excellent. Like uh, the first time I did this course, which is New Jersey, a few days ago, or 20 days ago, I kept saying, read the introduction. I think at the end of the course, maybe nine people read it. So. Already we have 11 people who read it, that's great. Uh, the reason I insist on people reading the introduction is that you need to understand what you're going to get in this course. And many times da'wah courses, they are, uh, or people expect da'wah courses, they, they expect it to be where it spoon feeds you on what to say in every possible scenario. Now as a teaching philosophy, I don't think that's fair to the student. I think it's better to equip the student with their own ability to respond to every refutation and even or to every like uh, yani, claim or question or even things they've never heard before. We're going to do that and you're going to see for yourself. We're going to present you with concepts that you may have never heard of at the end of this course and you'll be able to answer them by yourselves because you have the tools. So I want to start out by saying this is what we do inshallah in this course. We discuss the tools by which you're able to answer your own questions, by which you're able to formulate your own da'wah response. For example, when you go and buy a hammer from uh, Home Depot, when you buy a hammer, it doesn't tell you how in every possible situation you can use the hammer in. It's a tool. And you figure out, when you figure out how the tool works, you figure out where you can use it. So you might use it to drive a nail in. All right? You might use it to, you know, to do something else. You might use it to discipline your child. You become creative. <laughs> you become creative with that tool. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to go over the tools and then you can apply it in different situations. And I'm going to show you sometimes where I learned the tool from and I apply it in something absolutely different that has nothing to do with it. You know? Some of these tools you can use with people, you can even use with animals. We're going to discuss a lot of things. So how do we come up with this idea and why am I here teaching this course? Um, it started many, many years ago when I was forced to become a chaplain of some university in Virginia. And uh, they, had a, a, they had a very good chaplain before me, but the Dawah table was very weak. In about two or three years, they got about two shahadas, or maybe three shahadas, in two or three years. So it's about a shahada a year. All right? This was a Dawah table. It consisted of uh, books and materials and a bowl of candy and two brothers sitting behind the, the table, hoping people will come and take some material. And people would just come, grab some candy and walk away while these two brothers were just talking, chit-chatting with each other. Probably about the importance of da'wah and spreading the deen and all that stuff. So two people became Muslim in two or three years. And then uh, the first thing we wanted to do was kind of revamp and energize the da'wah table. So I put together the first ever version of uh, a workshop. It was about six hours long. And we taught it at the school. And this was in the middle of the semester. So from the middle of the semester till the end of the semester, about 17 people became Muslim. And that included some of the instructors and counselors at the school and so on and so forth. So it was the first indication that you can actually then teach people some ways of giving da'wah and make people into effective du'a without years of them running around the streets and talking to people and so on and so forth. So that was the first thing. So we did that. It was the first workshop and we saw these results. And then this person called their cousin, and this person called their relative in the other, another state. And so this MSA then invited me for it, then that MSA, and then so on and so forth. And then it became kind of a worldwide thing. So um, it's not like, uh, I'm not giving the course because I'm the best da'i or anything like that. But I've, I believe that I've put together the, the best approximation to what might be a quick and efficient way of giving da'wah. And to this course is not just da'wah to non-Muslims. We're going to talk about da'wah to Muslims and da'wah to non-Muslims. All different kinds of people. How do we refute this person, that person, and so on and so forth. 
But the most important thing is that we're going we're gonna to discuss some of the tools. And then you can take the tool and you can apply it in other, any situation uh, that you find yourself in. And so tonight we're actually going to cover just one part of the notes. We're going to cover uh, like uh, basically techniques of answering questions. Yeah. And um, perhaps then I thought we'll go over th the contents of the course together so you understand what we're going to do. So it's broken up into sections. If you open the, the table of contents, section one, we're going to talk about da'wah itself. And we're not going to do that tonight, obviously. And uh, we're going to define what da'wah is. And da'wah, by the way, is, uh, if you want to transliterate it into English, it's kind of what you see there. D-A, if you want to put the apostrophe for the ain, W-A-H. The H is important. Because if you write da'wah as D-A-W-A, there's a problem there. That's actually now a lie in Arabic or an allegation, a da'wah here as a lie. So, like from da'i, yeah? So they allege or they lie even. So there's one da'ya, and uh, every time I see his vehicle, I feel so bad because his car, his license plate is Dawa car, D A W A car, and his van is Dawa van. And every time I see it, it's like the lying mobile, you know? To the lying mobile. <laughs> Excellent. So we talk about uh, the, uh, the ruling on giving da'wah, and we're going to actually support the, the argument that says da'wah is an obligation upon everybody. Because there's another argument that says da'wah is only an obligation upon certain people. If they do it, then you don't have to do it. That's one opinion. But we're not going to take that opinion. We're going to see that the evidence, inshallah, is much stronger on the other side. That da'wah is obligatory upon everybody. Then, uh, then what is da'wah that, that's viable, that will remain? What makes it sustainable, what makes it stay and continue, not just some excitement, then it dies down and so on and so forth. Then in section 2 we talk about the da'ya, which is you, the person giving da'wah. And part of, uh, one of the things we want to do in this course is that, you see, realistically, everyone, we have the ability to understand people. All of us have the ability to understand people. All of us have the ability to, to read uh, expressions, to understand body language, but this is the issue, brothers and sisters. Most of us, we don't put enough effort into that field. So what we're going to try to do during these four days, is you just want to bring it up one notch, that you pay a little bit more attention to people, to understanding people. Because we all have the ability, all we have to do is just bring up our level of awareness a little higher. Okay? Like for example, if you ever watch some, let's say, let's something on TV in another language. You understand what's going on, right? You understand when they're fighting. You understand when they're worried. You understand when they're scared. And you don't understand the language, but you know it. Because you, now you, because you don't understand the language, you pay close attention to expressions, to, to voice inflection. And you understand what's going on. So, we also have the ability to understand each other. But most of the time, we don't put enough effort into it. And so all I'm going to tell you is, you just need to kick it up one notch. Just bring it up one notch, and you'll be able to understand people. You'll understand why they're asking certain questions. You'll be able to understand why they behave in a certain way. And then we'll, we'll have certain things. Certain, certain things will bring up a red flag. For example, a brother says something strange. Or a brother does something, every, I mean, the same strange thing every other day, or does it, would, he keeps saying the same strange thing to every other person that he sees. There's something behind that. We just want to bring it up, like I said, one notch, try to understand people a little better. And that's going to happen, inshallah, by the end of this course. So, part of being able to understand others is firstly understanding yourself. And that's why we talk about extroverts, introverts. We talk about something later on called the uh, categorization of, of personality types. And um, I learned this in, uh, I took this course uh, in negotiating. Anyone here take a negotiating course? Fantastic. Excellent. Very good. So, the instructor said the closest thing I can give you to a magic wand would be the three personality types. Now, we're just going to go over it for what it's worth. And actually, there's not a single question in the exam about the three personality types. But the reason it's there is that you can use it for da'wah. And we're going to discuss how you can use it for da'wah. You know what? Everything is da'wah if you're in da'wah mode. Everything is da'wah if you're in da'wah mode. You can see anything, and because you're in da'wah mode, you see a da'wah advantage in it. Just the other day I read an article, 
about some, uh, some research that was done by a doctor in Austria, if I remember correctly. It was about picking your nose. Yeah? It's about, uh, it's true, true research. This doctor in Austria, he says that it's actually very good for your health to pick your nose and eat it. And he, is, he says that it's, uh, when, and when it's dry, yeah, eat it, he says. It's actually very good because <laughs> the, it's, I love disgusting things. You also discover that as we, we move along. So he says that when you eat uh, this material, it has in it all kinds of bacteria that has been captured by your nostrils and so on. And when it goes into your stomach, it builds up your immunity. He says it's a, it's a shame that children have this good habit and we teach them not to do it. <laughs> yeah. I remember one time uh, when we were young, my brother, we were, we were at uh, a bakery. And he said there was a girl, you know how these little kids, that, their nose is just running all the way down like that. They have their little Hitler mustache, but it's all just snot. He said this girl just grabbed a piece of bread, she just went like that. <laughs> they ate it. <laughs> Fantastic. So this guy's arguing that you know it's good, you know it's good for you. Eat it. If it's dry, eat it. Why not? Now, what does it have to do with dawah? Everything. If you're in dawah mode, everything has to do with dawah. You know what this tells you? It tells you that sometimes facts or sometimes falsehood can have some facts and they can be accurate. But so what? True. So what? doesn't mean because it's falsehood, there's not going to be anything to support it. They're not going to have any argument. Sometimes they have a logical argument, but it doesn't make it okay. For example, one time, and I know this is a... Well, one of the New Jersey students, he told me that, uh, you know, you, you teach uh, using poop a lot. He saw a brownie surprise on the internet and things like that, yeah? So this was an atheist, very aggressive guy in uh, where I used to work. And he was arguing very aggressively that if it's natural, there's nothing wrong with it. So he's talking about women uh, flaunting their sexual desires and things like that. It's, it's there, it's natural, so why not flaunt it? I told him, okay. He was being aggressive, so I had to be aggressive. I said, okay. I told him it's natural to have a bowel movement. I want you to sit up on this table right here, pull your pants down, and have a bowel movement in front of us. You're not going to do it. Because not everything that's natural should be flaunted in public. He was quiet immediately. So, he might come up with a fact, but that doesn't make it okay. I'll give you something else. For example, you know, uh, some people, uh, who's heard the end of music here? Excellent. Okay, just three people. Basically, the end of music is a lecture online about, uh, about music being impermissible. Right? So, some people argue that it is permissible. Why? Because it's something that's natural. And here's their argument. A little child. No one has taught this child how to dance. When they listen to music, they naturally do what? Bounce. Immediately. So they're arguing, this is something natural that Allah put in us. And so they bounce, and so it can't be haram. And so, what about then? Sexual urges of teenagers. It's natural. Does that mean it's okay? It's okay. And you go ahead and, and act upon that? No. So the fact that you give me a, a, a piece of information or a fact, it doesn't make it okay. So falsehood sometimes can have an argument, or it can have a fact, or there can be a study. But it doesn't make it okay. And by the way, just to answer that, you know why kids bounce immediately? Because the part of the brain that's in charge of motor movements is the same part of the brain that's in charge of audio, audio appreciation or music or things like that. That's why there's, it's natural for, for the bouncing to occur. So anyways, the point is then, when you're in da'wah mode, anything that you see, anything that you hear, you can see a da'wah benefit from, from that. So, for the next, uh, until the end of this course, we're going to be in da'wah mode. We're going to kick it up a notch with understanding people, and reading people, and understanding why people say certain things or do certain things. And that's going to make a huge difference for us. And that's why, you know, in order to understand people, first you understand yourself. So we talk about extroverts, introverts. You know, uh, any salespeople in the audience? Anyone sells cars here? Okay. Okay, very good. Two people. We're, I'm going to call on you a lot, inshallah. You're going to prove some points for us here. But and I'm sure in, you know some of the people in your business very snaky, right? Some snakes in your business, right? Now, uh, car, car salesmen, they understand a lot of psychology as well. You know that if you're, if you're extroverted, how they sell you the car? 
They keep telling you about how people will react when they see you in the car. They say that to you because you're extroverted. So they tell you, when you park this thing in front of your driveway today, your neighbors are going to go crazy. People are going to look all over and say, what's this? And people are going to want to talk to you because of this car. That's how they sell you the car, based on your personality. If you're introverted, they tell you what the car will do for you. And I'll tell you an interesting statistic. They tell you that 96% of people who go to buy a new car, they end up not buying the car that they wanted. 96% of people. 96% of people who buy a brand new car, they buy a model they didn't want, they buy a brand they didn't want, the size of engine they didn't want, the color they didn't want. What does that tell you? It tells you that the salesperson can influence them that much. That much. And that's why they're so used to, to manipulating people. Well, of course, with the exception of our two brothers in the audience. They're so used to manipulating people that they don't listen to you. They don't care anymore. You know, I went to a dealership one time. I told the guy, now look what I asked him. He said, show me a sedan. Japanese. For under $10,000. You won't believe what he showed me. Okay? He showed me some ugly American SUV. Some kind of Jimmy or Blazer. I can't stand those cars with all respect to those who have a Blazer. Yeah? So he showed me a Blazer. So that's, that's an SUV. And it's American. And it was for $12,000. It's just exactly the opposite of everything I asked him for. You know why? He doesn't care. He's so used to making people buy what he wants to sell. So he wasn't even listening to me. He's like, I'll, I'll make you buy this. Some, sometimes you hear these horrific, horrific stories about people coming in and then just totally being ripped off. And some stories are incredible. You wonder what's wrong with these people. How could they do that to someone? The other person, how could they allow someone to manipulate them that much? So there was one story where this woman came in and uh, she, she had a very nice car, but they, they gave her like $500 for her car. And she bought some new car, some other car. And she drove that for five days. And they called her back. They told her there's a problem. And we need to take the car back from you. She came back, gave back the new car. And they sold her back her old car for $5,000. Exactly. What? Imagine that's your wife. You're like, you did what? What you do? As a joke, I always do this to my wife. When we're having a discussion or something, I always do this. Then I go like that. <laughs> but my wife, she doesn't mess around. She's like, come on, hit me. Come on. <laughs> okay. So, talk about manners. That's so important, you know. You know, uh, sometimes in Arabic, when someone uh, is not well-mannered, they tell you, ma'andu uh, akhlaq. He doesn't have manners. Even in English, this person doesn't have manners. You know, actually, akhlaq in Arabic, akhlaq is how you deal with people. That's what it means. Akhlaq is the way you treat and you deal with people. So, you can't not have akhlaq. Everyone has akhlaq. But some people have good akhlaq, some people have bad akhlaq. There's no such thing as he doesn't have manners. I mean, how can someone not have any manners? Probably someone that doesn't exist. Doesn't have any manners at all. So everyone has akhlaq. They're either good or they're bad or somewhere in the middle. Because manners or akhlaq in Arabic is how you treat people. So you either treat people well, you, treat, you don't treat people well. If you don't have any manners, you probably don't have anyone around you. You're probably dead or something, or live in a desert, something like that. So that's section two, talking about the da'iyah. Section three, we talk about the mad'u, the person that you're calling to Allah, because you need to understand that person. And here it means Muslim or non-Muslim. Muslim or non-Muslim. Because people have different issues, people have different questions. Yeah? I'll tell you this, this is a very simple one. It's a true story. One time someone came up to me, pulled me aside a little from the crowd, and listened to the wording now. He said, I just want to check. Is weed halal? <laughs> and he's doing this to me. What do you think? What do you think is going on there? It's quite clear, right? First of all, look at the language. I just want to check. And just in case, in case this is not right. Yeah? Is weed halal? And usually Muslims don't say, is this halal? They say, is this haram? But he's saying, is this halal? He wants it to be. And he's nodding. Yeah? Is weed halal? And then a dead giveaway when I said, of course, it's haram. He went like this. He's probably thinking, last night. <laughs> haram? So that's just a, a very simple example. But sometimes it gets a little bit more complicated. You need to understand the person. What are they really trying to tell you? We're going to look at a lot of examples, inshallah. 
Is that for me? Thank you. No, I want the candy. The candy. If not, yeah. mashallah. Sheikh's son fool around and stuff, and everyone's just nice to the Sheikh's son. <laughs> Deep down, everybody's like. Okay. Uh, section four, we talk about, uh, you know, with the actually calling people, yeah, calling people back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The techniques, the methods, we're going to discuss a lot of things. And uh, I personally like it, if, I, if I read a book, if I take a course, I like something new, something different there. And so there's going to be some new stuff, some, some discussions maybe you haven't heard, like... The one there on section 4, we're going to talk about logic versus emotion. Which do people use more? Emotion, right? Psychologists tell you that 90% of your decisions are based on emotion. Yeah? So then, what, which does Allah use more in the Quran? Logic or emotion? Who says logic? Put your hands up. Excellent. Who says emotion? Put your hands up. Okay. Who says both? Put your hand up. Excellent. Guess what? You're all wrong. Yeah. You'll find out why tomorrow. Not tomorrow. When are we doing the, the logic? Next week. Yeah. Bear with me. <laughs> then we're going to discuss tools and techniques, changing people, changing behavior, why people don't change. Muslim, non-Muslim, everybody. Why people don't change. We're going to look at many reasons why people don't change. Section 5, we're going to talk about religions. We're going to talk about beliefs. We're going to take care of the atheist. We're going to take care of the Trinity. It's no big deal there. But we're going to take care of the atheist. Because a lot of people are scared of the atheist. A lot of people are afraid of the atheist. They're just scared. A lot of Muslims just don't want to deal with the atheist. The atheist is easy to deal with. Don't ever be scared. Inshallah, we're going to examine their minds, why they even became atheists. We're going to talk about a lot of things and then uh, destroy the atheists, inshallah. And then there's uh, in section 5, it says at the end there, hamburgers are my lifestyle. What is that section about, you think? Anybody? Yes, sir. Close, but not. What does it mean, hamburgers are my lifestyle? Anyone want to guess? None? No, we're actually going to talk about homosexuality there. <laughs> Why do I call it hamburgers are my lifestyle? Well, one reason is that uh, when, when Al Maghrib headquarters looked at my, my outline, they said, you know, if you're stopped at airports and people see this, they might think you're spreading hatred against gays and everything. So I said, hamburgers are my lifestyle. Because the truth is, that's what homosexuality is. It's a desire. And a desire is never a lifestyle. True? So I desire, this is true, so I'm not, not making this up. I desire hamburgers. I desire hamburgers all the time. I'm happy to be in California because you have In-N-Out Burger, which is my favorite. They're the best. So I desire hamburger all the time. You can wake me up at 2 in the morning, give me a hamburger, I'll just, I'll just eat it. <laughs> I love hamburgers. But I don't walk around saying it's my lifestyle. You like fried chicken, it's not your lifestyle. It's a desire. Since when it desire your entire lifestyle? This is not. So we're going to look at the, the truth. What, what is really, you know, what's, what's behind those people with the, uh, with the loose limbs and the ligaments and stuff? What's their issue? I'm going to talk about that. You know what, my gay story goes like this. You know what a, you know what a gaydar is? Yeah, yeah? See, it's your, your radar, your ability to detect a gay person. And some people have very strong gaydar. Who is a strong gaydar? Put your hands up. Fantastic. Okay, just one person has strong gaydar around here? But basically, I'm sure you, the minute you just take one look, you know he's gay. Immediately, right? <laughs> Excellent. My younger brother is like that. Just, he, just one look, he's gay. Now for me, my gaydar is like broken. I'm giving Dawa to this guy in the streets in DC. And I, I work him up to the, the Shahada, right? So I ask him for the Shahada. He says, I can't. My lifestyle won't allow it. I said, what is this guy talking about? He said, look man, I don't know what you mean by that. We already agreed, you agreed on everything. You have the ingredients to become Muslim. Why walk away non-Muslim? I work on him again, ask for the Shahada one more time. He says, I can't. My lifestyle won't allow it. I said, listen man. I've been doing this for many, many years. No one's ever said lifestyle to me. You keep saying lifestyle. What is your lifestyle? He said, I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> and only then, when he says I'm gay, do I suddenly realize a lot of things. And here I am talking to you about being perceptive and stuff. 
Suddenly I realize he's wearing a pink t-shirt. <laughs> and he's got the gay sleeve going on. You know what the gay sleeve is? The sleeve isn't here. And it's not here either. It's like that. You know what I'm talking about? That weird gay sleeve thing. I suddenly notice the gay sleeve. I notice the pink t-shirt. I notice loose limbs and stuff. I go, oh. So at that point, we didn't know what, how to deal with it. We just kept staring at him like that. <laughs> and I was tempted to. I mean, even, even now, I'm tempted to make a joke about him taking shahada but praying in the front row, but I'm not going to make that joke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so we wanted, you know, the truth is, it's just a desire. It's not a lifestyle, it's not a right. I'm going to look at some of the arguments they present. Because everybody wants a piece of you, brothers and sisters. That's the truth. Everybody wants a piece of you. You know one description I like of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. They said that if, whenever he spoke about a topic, you felt like he spent his entire life preparing that one topic. Any topic he spoke about, you felt like it's as if that's his, like his thesis, his dissertation was just this one topic. But tomorrow he gives a lecture on another topic and you feel like he spent his whole life preparing this topic. Then he gives another lecture on another topic and you feel like his whole life was preparing this topic. Now, we can't all be like that, but we should be well-rounded. We, because everybody wants a piece of you today. Everybody wants a piece of you. The atheist wants a piece of you. You know, the, the gay rights activist wants a piece of you. Everybody wants a piece of you. So you have to be able to answer this person, answer that person, and put this person in their place, and put that person in their place. This is the reality. We live here. This is how it is. Everybody wants a piece of the Muslim. Muslims want a piece of the Muslim. Right? We're even going to talk about other things. We're refuting and what, what kind of nice, good arguments can you give, you know, when it comes to issues of madahib and all kinds of other fit issues. How can you convince people? Different arguments. We're going to do all that, inshallah. Let me know when it's time to break. Yeah? So, that's yani, more or less what's in the table of God. Section 6 actually is when we discuss you know, follow-up techniques when it comes to reverts specifically. Because a lot of work needs to be done when it comes to that. Okay. So now we're going to, we're going to go over a certain uh, area in the notes. And even if we have to break for in the middle of this section, it's not a big deal. It's just the only thing that we're going to do today. Now, uh, but let me, before that, let me just talk to you a little bit about uh, those who have attended the workshop in the past. And I actually have given it in California, probably, uh, I've given it in this masjid, this was uh, in 2007. This was, I gave a six hour version or workshop, it was called how to give or to get a shahada in, in ten minutes. I was going to say six. Yeah. So how to give a shahada in ten minutes. This was the, the workshop that I was talking to you about in the beginning. This is a lot more than that. It will have some of those techniques incorporated. But this is like, this is four days, it's not just a six hour workshop. Yeah. But uh, what about that six hour workshop? Yani, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, who, who has attended that before? Excellent, good, not too many people, that's good. So, uh, the, the Shahada workshop basically, I've been teaching it for the last six or seven years. And there are many who have attended it and they've become superb, superb du'at. There's actually a brother in Toronto who, uh, who heard it online. And he started a da'wah team, and he brought, by, by an early count, yani, I don't know what the numbers are today, he brought 160 people to Islam. And he retained 95% of them remain upon Islam, which is very, very high. So of his 160, 95% remain upon Islam. Um, I got an email from a brother in, uh, in Saudi Arabia who's doing da'wah to the non-Muslims there. This was like many years ago, maybe five years ago or something. And he heard it online as well, and like at that point, 53 people had become Muslim from the foreigners working in Saudi Arabia. I got an email from someone in the UK, and he heard there's a five-hour audio version of it, so it's five CDs. He heard the first two and a half CDs online. This is what his email he sent me. He says, then he paused it to go out and get dinner. He says, on the way I saw a non-Muslim. So I said something from the workshop. So he gave an expected answer that was mentioned in the workshop. I gave him another answer from the workshop. He says the guy took his shahada. So he writes in his email, he says, I only listened to half the workshop and I got a shahada. What happens when I listen to the whole thing? I said, you get a shahada in 10 minutes. That's what happened. <laughs> of course now that title, it's not a guarantee, right? It's just, it's just a marketing title, interesting title. But a lot of times people get upset and Muslims come angry at me. How dare you? 
I, and sometimes even reverts come angry. It took me a year. You talk about 10 minutes. I'm like, yeah, it took you a year. It doesn't have to take everybody a year. It was done in 10 minutes. You know, I used to talk about this story of uh, passing out pamphlets. I gave a guy a pamphlet. So, this is a million family march in D.C. We're passing out pamphlets all day. I'm walking this way. He's walking the other way. I give him a pamphlet. I keep walking. I turn around. He stopped. He's reading it. What should I do? What do you think? No? Go back. Why should I go back to him? But what, what made you say go back to him? Why? Excellent. Because he's reading. Excellent. Because he's reading and he stopped. All day you give someone a pamphlet, just take it, they keep walking. This man stopped. So as a day, you read these signs. So he stopped. There's something there. I just walked back to him. I still haven't said a word. When I got there, he said, okay, what do I do now? He said, for what? He said, to become Muslim. I said, you know that it's serious and you can't leave. And he said, yes, yes, I know all that. What do I do? He took his shadow right then and there. It wasn't even 10 minutes, it wasn't even 10 seconds. Gave him the pamphlet and he wants to become Muslim. I'm that good, by the way. <laughs> no, it has nothing to do with me. And it could have been anyone else in this audience. It's just that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts you at the right place at the right time. Maybe this person's been searching for months. Maybe he's been reading, maybe he read half the Quran already. Maybe this was just the last straw. That he's been thinking about Islam and suddenly a Muslim gives him a pamphlet and he took it, took it as a sign maybe. You know? So, it's possible. And um, there have been a lot of people who have taken the course and they've become excellent du'at and they've had great results and so on and so forth. One time a 15 year old took the workshop. This was, like I said, the six hour version. And uh, next day his best friend became Muslim. And he even writes, he says that he's better than a lot of Muslims now, you know. So, it's possible. So, uh, yani, what I'm trying to tell you is that the, the short version worked so well for so many people and there's so many success stories alhamdulillah what happens with the full version inshallah khair happens I'm not going to say give you minutes or anything like that okay so we're on page 62 of the notes we're going to discuss that that's all we're going to do tonight nine if we can get to, to the nine or six actually six techniques of answering questions okay why this section specifically I'll tell you, first of all, that uh, a lot of Muslims think their job as a da'iyah is just to answer questions. You talk a little bit about Islam, any questions, and then the guy starts to ask you all kinds of ridiculous questions, and you just answer, and you just answer. And of course, you have to acknowledge all questions as intelligent questions, and then respond. And so, you, sometimes what happens is, you might be in a bad place here. So for example, the first question. Why does God need us to worship Him? See that question? And it's a common question. Why does God need us to worship Him? Don't start answering this question. Because if you start answering it, no matter how you answer it, you're wrong. True? No matter how you answer it. Because Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْجِنَّ You're wrong. Because Allah is so great and so magnificent that He's deserving of being worshipped. You're wrong. Why? What's wrong with the question? Because look at that question. Why does God need us to worship Him? And the truth is, Allah does not need us to worship Him. If you don't fix the question first, no matter how you answer it, you're telling them, this is why Allah needs us to worship Him. So first thing you have to do is, fix the question. Number two, can God create a four-sided triangle? And here people get excited. Yes, yes, of course he can. Yes, he can. And what's, uh, what's funny? <laughs> There's no such thing as a four-sided triangle. Unless you're an idiot, that's a square or a rectangle. This triangle has three sides. So don't accept this premise. It's wrong. I'm just going to say, yes, of course you can create a four-sided triangle. He can even make it 15 sides. In your eye also he can create it. No, Habibi. <laughs> There's no such thing as a 15-sided triangle. It's not a triangle anymore. Well, why should I accept this premise? Uh, number three, an atheist asks, this one is a little more tricky. What is, what is it about the Qur'an that makes you show, so sure that there is a God? What is it about the Qur'an that makes you so sure there is a God? Now, I was asked this question recently by two atheists. And they kept repeating it. I didn't know how to answer this question. I just found it difficult to answer. 
And then I realized why I found it so difficult to answer. Because I, mean, I didn't know where to start. I mean, it's just, because, because they're starting from the wrong platform. They're assuming there is no God, so what's your proof there is? But I'm saying there's so much evidence in the Qur'an. I mean, where do I start? Is it from the science? Or is it from the knowledge of the future? Or is it from the grammar in the Qur'an? Or is it from all the, per I mean, the perfect solutions to problems? Or is it from just the life of Muhammad Wasallam? that's proof that he was a genuine prophet of Allah? Where do I start? But he's assuming that he's right, and so what's your proof? Yeah? طيب. So it says there in the notes, no matter how well you answer question number one, you will always be affirming that God needs us to worship Him. You need to fix the question first before you proceed. So the rule is, do not immediately accept the person's premise, or you may be at a disadvantage. I think everyone sees how that applies now. All kinds of ridiculous questions will come at you. You know the one about the rock, right? Can God create a rock that is so big that nothing, no living thing can move it? And immediately your answer is, yes. And then they say, can God move it? And if you say yes, you're in trouble because that means He cannot create a rock that is so big that no living thing can move it, if He can move it. And if you say no, He can create a rock so big that He can't move, so you're in trouble. So the best answer to it is, Uh, I think that's coming up. We'll come back to it. Okay, so the first technique of answering questions, I call it the flip side of the argument. Okay. You give the opposite side and it makes it clear to people. You flip it around and it becomes clear to people why, it, first of all, why the question is wrong, for example. So you get them to think of the opposite of this argument and you, you get them to understand why their question is incorrect to begin with. So, A, question A, why do Muslims grow their beards? And actually a non-Muslim once asked me this question. He used to work at a company where there were many Muslims. He noticed the Muslims had beards. So he asked me, I want to ask you, why is it that Muslims always grow their beard? And I, my answer was, I understand why you're asking me that question. Meaning, considering the environment in which we live. I said, but I actually don't grow it. It comes out by itself. <laughs> True or false? It's not like I wake up and put some manure and go outside in the sun, check, is it growing? Huh? Is it growing? It just comes out by itself. So I told him, because what is natural is when a male matures, he develops facial hair. I told him, if you ask a child now to draw the face of a man and the face of a woman, the child will naturally add facial hair to the face of the man. Because when a man develops, he naturally produces facial hair. So what is natural is for your hair to grow out. But what is not natural is to insist every morning on removing every stubble of hair and cutting yourself in the process and putting the cologne and sticking the little tissues all so you can say, ah, like that guy in the Gillette commercial. <laughs> yeah. So when I, asked, when I said this to him, guess what he said? Because I could have told him it's the way of all the prophets of Allah and all the prophets had beards. And, but you know what? When I said that to him, you know what he said? He said, you know what? I never thought of that. I shouldn't ask you why you grow your beard. You should ask me why. <laughs> so, what happens here? We're using this technique. You flip the question around and suddenly they understand what's so clear about it. You know, uh, why are Muslim women covered? That's the second one. And this is a true story. There was a, a, a sheikh giving a lecture. It was a room where men on the right, women on the left. And then a non-Muslim woman came in very angry, yelling out loud in the middle of this event. She's pointing at the Muslim woman. Why are they covered? And you know what they mean, right? Muslim women are covered, they're oppressed, yeah? Everyone else is covered, it's okay. The nun is covered just because she's, you know, keeping herself pure. And, but the Muslim woman is covered because she is... She's oppressed. So she came in angrily yelling, why are they covered like that? So the, the speaker said to her, no, he's, he's, getting her to, he's getting to flip it, yeah, flip, the flip side. He said, well, I see that you're covered also, and you're clothed, but you were born naked, why are you covered? So she said, uh, modesty. He said, well, modesty? More modesty. Khalas. <laughs> makes sense. If covering is modesty, that means the more you cover, the more modest you are. You know what? You can flip it around more, but I don't recommend you ever use this, yeah? 
But the argument is that if, if, if you're covered, that means you're, you're uh, yeah, oppressed. That means the more uncovered you are, the more liberated you are. So you could, yeah, and essentially you could tell a woman, well, I see that you are not fully liberated at the moment. Why don't you liberate yourself some more? Right? <laughs> you're not going to use that, yeah? But that would, that would be the same thing. Well, you're not fully liberated either. You know? When you're totally liberated, then come talk to me. We can discuss. Uh, uh? So, uh, the Quran is created and not the word of Allah. And this is what uh, those of you who know the biography of Imam Ahmad and the, the fitna and all that, the mihna. This was the argument of, uh, of the people who are like the, the Mu'tazila. They're saying that, and see look, when you hear the argument, it sounds like they're trying to respect Allah. But when you flip it around, it becomes a problem. And that's how he defeated them in many debates. He flipped it around on them. So they said that Allah is qadim, and he ancient, that he's been there for a long time. And speech is something renewable. So it's not befitting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being al qadim, he has a renewable attribute. And people speak. So how can people speak? And Allah speaks. And the ayah says in the Quran, Laysa kamithlihi shay. There's nothing like him. So how can people speak? And Allah speaks. So they concluded, Allah doesn't speak. So he got them at one point, he flipped it on them. You're saying that because people speak, Allah can't speak. So then he said, do you have knowledge? The man was quiet immediately. Because if you have knowledge, and Allah has knowledge, and nothing is like Allah, that means either you don't, يعني, if you have knowledge, Allah doesn't have knowledge. And actually one of them at some point in the debate, he said, uh, yes, يعني, at some point Allah didn't have knowledge. So Imam tells him, kafar. You've become a disbeliever. So then the guard, there was a guard, just an ignorant person standing. So he got angry. He says, how could you say that to the messenger of Amir al-Mu'mineen? Because he was sent by the Khalifa. So how could you say that to him, that he is not a Muslim? So Imam Ahmed tells this simple guard, he tells, he's saying that Allah had no knowledge until he created his knowledge. And how could Allah create his own knowledge without having any knowledge? And he says, the narrator says, the guard then angrily looked at the other guy. How dare you? So he flipped it around on them. Yeah? So, flipping the argument around. Sometimes people tell you Allah is not on his throne. Even until now, Muslims, they'll be amongst us and they pray with us. They say Allah is not on his throne. Now look how they make it sound respectful. If you say Allah is on his throne, you are physically limiting Allah. You see this word? It makes the Muslim guilty. You are physically limiting Allah if you say he's on his throne. Don't physically limit Allah. Where do you get this term from, physically limiting? And, but they just make you ashamed. Don't say Allah is on His throne. If you say that, you're physically limiting Him. But what's the flip side of that? The flip side is that He's physically everywhere. And these people until now, they never answer the question, is He in the bathroom? They stay quiet. Is He in the church? They stay quiet. Is He in other places that you, you wouldn't be caught dead in these places? They, they're quiet. Is He in the bar? They're quiet. So, if you don't want to say he's on his throne, and by the way, Allah said he's on his throne. Six times in the Quran, he's on Rahman al Arsh Stawa. He's on his throne. So if, you, if he's not on his throne, then the flip side of your argument is worse. He's everywhere. And that's why many Muslims historically have gone astray concerning this issue. And even wrote poetry saying, in, يعني, وَمَا الْكَلْبُ وَالْخِنْزِيرُ إِلَّا إِلَهُنَا And the, the dog and the pig is nothing but our, our God. How can a Muslim say that? Could possibly, could you believe a Muslim would say, the dog and the pig is our God? You, you wouldn't believe that, right? But they did. Why? Because it started off with this concept. Initially trying to respect Allah, but the flip side of it was worse than what they were trying to avoid in the beginning. Because now, the pig takes up space, the dog takes up space, and if God is in everything, then He's inside, Allah is far removed from that, then He's inside this space. And they said, even the monk in the monastery is our God. One of them, instead of saying Subhanallah, he said, Subhani, Subhani. Because yeah. I'm God, God's in me. That's why a lot of these the deviant, these deviant groups, they respect and they treat people very nicely. Why? Not because of akhlaq, because God is in them. They believe that. They believe Allah is in you. So if I hit you, I'm hitting Him. So I have to be nice to you. That's why they're nice to people. So they got in more trouble by trying to avoid something simple. The flip side was worse here. Um, 
why do, why do bad things happen to good people? That's a question you get many times from Muslims, from non-Muslims, mostly from non-Muslims. Uh, he said five minutes for salah. Naam? Two minutes for salah. Why do bad things happen to good people? Who can flip that around for us? That was tough for salah. Why do bad things happen to good people? Okay, why do good things happen to bad people? I like that. It's a good flip. There's another one. It gets people to think. And you're worried, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do good things happen to bad people? No, nothing good should happen to them. What's another? You can flip it around by saying, well, how much intervention do you want? And he, if there's a good person, nothing bad should happen to them at all. They're about to slip, suddenly there's a big feather pillow underneath them. They're falling off a ladder, there's a big pillow, a big mattress under them. Posturpedic even, not just any mattress. Naam? Uh -huh. So now you look at it from another angle, from patience, from the will of Allah Azawajal, from the tests in this life and so on and so forth. But you just flip it around. Would you want God to intervene in everything? So if you're a good person, nothing happens to you, never get scratched, you know, never fall, nothing breaks. How much intervention do you want in life? Okay, we'll stop here, we'll continue inshallah after salah. Zakum Allah khairan, sallallahu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.